Hi everyone, my name is Michał Baranowski, I'm a director of GMF Warsaw and I'm here with Andrzej Babinski, I am the head of Politica Insights a Center for Policy Policies Anal Policy Analysis in Warsaw. It's fantastic to see good friends on the screen and on the other side of the camera. Welcome to everyone in Warsaw, in uh, Washington, in Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and I'm sure some other places uh, as well. Uh, on behalf of GMF, uh, for those who don't know GMF, GMF is a transatlantic think tank with offices in all those places. And we are super excited to be joining with Political Insight, who we think are the smartest people in town on analyzing Polish politics, uh, economics, and foreign relations. So we are very glad to um, uh, partner up with Political Insight, where we hope to bring also perspective from the outside. Thank you very much, Michal. <clears throat> We're very excited to be doing this, and thank you for taking the time to speak to us and to tell us what the perspective is for Poland in um, France, Germany, and the United States. Um, I think what we'd like to do is to start with a question to Wojtek Szatski if he's online. We can't see him. Um, I don't know if he's going to appear at some point. Um, but basically, the question I wanted to ask him was uh, who won the selection and why? Wojtek, can you hear us? So as Wojtek is turning on his camera, hopefully, let me just remind everyone who doesn't follow the Polish politics on an everyday basis, and uh, everyone on this screen has been doing this uh, for sure. Uh, we had uh, the second round of the election took place last Sunday. President Duda uh, won with 51.03% of the vote. Um, uh, Rafał Trzaskowski uh, received 48.97% of the vote, and the turnout was 68.2, which is the highest turnout since 1995. Um, I see that Wojtek is unmuting. Uh, it's a good question whether whether he's able to join us via with with the camera. So. But I, I began answering Andrzej's question, who won, uh, in, terms of, in terms of the election itself. But uh, Wojtek, do you, can, you, can you join us to tell us a little bit more uh, why? Okay, listen, what I propose we do is we wait for Wojtek to figure out the technical issues. And maybe we're going to start with Marek Kwiatkowski. Um, and ask you, Marek, what do you think this means? Without going into internal politics, what, what do you think this victory, Andrzej Duda's victory, means for Poland's foreign policy, foreign and defense policy? Yes, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I think we will see a lot of continuation. We may see some adaptation, uh, and we can expect some changes. Uh, but um, I wouldn't expect any major shift, at least for the time being. Um, first of all, the continuation part. Uh, of course, this is uh, because the Polish security and defense policy is largely shaped by external situation and, and by ex also by external forces to a certain degree, which will not change strategically in, in the, the coming uh, months and, and years. That is, you know, NATO's response and EU's response to the Russian threat will continue and continue evolving, and also to other security uh, challenges, including the US military presence in, in Europe and also in Poland. This also will continue, as well as the ongoing transformation of the Polish armed forces and, and the Polish defense uh, doctrines and policies will continue uh, to go on. So this will probably remain on track. Uh, and of course, the, the main factor of this continuation is the fact that both in terms of legislative and uh, as well as uh, executive powers, uh, the recent elections brought uh, confirmation of, of this right-wing ruling camp. Uh, which has defined its uh, security and defense goals quite clearly, and they have adopted, uh, adopted implementation uh, of it. That is, you know, first of all, the strengthening of bilateral security link with the United States, 
with the expansion of the US military uh, presence throughout the so-called Eastern flank and also in Poland, um, they have put emphasis on enhancement as to the shape and form of the Polish military and creating some new security structures in the regions, including with the, with the countries between the Baltic, Black and Adriatic Sea, the initiatives uh, called uh, the Free Seas and, and, and Tri Seas uh, initiatives. I'm sure you know all about that. There is also continuity in terms of Poland's willingness to continue uh, contributing uh, to, to wider security arrangements, including NATO missions and operations, UN peacekeeping. We have just returned last year to the Lebanon UN mission and also to the EU defense and security cooperation schemes. Well, in respect to the latter, we can also, we can, we, we can of course discuss how, what is the, whether the, le the level of Polish ambitions really re represent the, the potential of, uh, uh, of the country, but at least there is no reluctance to uh, uh, contribute and, and, and take part. And I can also say there is also continuity on the US side of the equation. First of all, to remain engaged in NATO's eastern flank, including Poland, and that Poland is actually, um, it has already become or is in the process of becoming the hub for US forces and for US activities uh, in the region maybe regardless of whatever change there, there may or may not be in the White House in the result of November elections. Because as we know, both the military uh, of the United States, as well as the majority of political, um, uh, political factions is supporting um, continuation of the, the US presence and US activities, barring for a, you know, a total NATO pullout, which is at at least at the moment, not quite on the horizon. So there, is, there will be a lot of continuity uh, for those reasons, but there may be some adaptation. And the adaptation may come from the fact, of course, of you know, Joe Biden arriving to the White House, and uh, we will see what change in narratives that will bring on both sides. I would, I would emphasize the, uh, the word narratives, because as, as I said, the strategic um, strategic foundation of, of, the, of both the US policies re, uh, in, regard, in respect to Poland and of course the Polish policy, uh, policies towards the United States will probably remain intact. There will also be some adaptation to economic realities if they hit hard uh, uh, after uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And so far we have seen the uh, authorities in Poland keeping the, uh, the public uh, somewhat isolated from the uh, from the you know hard figures that that may come in in result of that crisis, but there may be also some impact on the defense budget and and wider defense uh, policies, and of course I would say probably the largest impact in strategic terms uh, and and the largest adaptation that we may face in the coming years, maybe not months, is the China issue. Uh, if it becomes a, a, a very serious matter on the forum of NATO and the EU. Uh, and I would say that probably this area, the strategic uh, rivalry uh, between the US, China and Russia is something that we will uh, need to think very strongly about how to adapt to and how to fit into uh, in order not to lose the gains that we've gained in, in recent uh, years in, in respect to defense and deterrence and also the wider security uh, policies. I will stop now and I'm ready to continue discussions with you if there will be any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Marek. I'm happy to see that Wojtek has joined us. Wojtek, can you see us? Can you hear us? You, I think you need to unmute now. This is, we can see you, we need to hear you. Okay, Wojtek, the question that, yeah, the question that you were asked was who won and why? Michal covered the who won bit. So if you could quickly tell us why Andrzej Duda won and what this means for Polish politics in for say the next 24 months? Well, first of all, Andrzej Duda uh, won because uh, 
well, he managed to mobilize uh, most of his base and because of the high turnout uh, in the countryside. Uh, it was a long time tradition in Poland that uh, people in the countryside didn't vote as often as uh, people uh, in the cities. And uh, right now it has changed. And the turnout in the countryside was almost as high as in the cities. And the support of Andrzej Duda uh, was much higher in the countryside uh, than the support for uh, Rafał Trzaskowski. And I guess this is the basic reason why Andrzej Duda won the election. Uh, and also, well, he was a clear favorite of the election uh, since the beginning of the campaign. Uh, he's, uh, he has a bigger base, uh, more uh, devoted fans. Uh, mm, he's supported by uh, the biggest political party in Poland. Uh, the ruling party with all the tools that the government has to support the candidate. And it all played well in his campaign, uh, whereas Rafał Trzaskowski had to gather different uh, types of electorate, uh, not only uh, from liberal opposition, but also from the left, and also some conservative voters and also uh, some voters of uh, Krzysztof Bosak, uh, the right-wing candidate, uh, and he basically didn't have a big chance of winning this election. And uh, so the result of the election didn't come as a surprise, uh, even though uh, Rafał Trzaskowski uh, received uh, over 10 million votes, which was widely expected to be enough, uh, but Andrzej Duda had uh, 10.4 million votes. And uh, with th th this was the second best result in the history of Polish presidential elections. Only Lech Wałęsa 30 years ago had 200,000 uh, votes more than Andrzej Duda now. Okay, Wojtek, and could you tell us what this means for the next, for the coming months for Poland? Do you think that um, this means that peace will be in charge, or do you think there is uh, internal turmoil ahead? Do you think basically that we will see uh, a continuation over the next three years until the next election, or do you think it's possible that something could still change? Um, not in this election, but in elections to come, as in a snap election, for example. Well, basically, I don't believe in a snap election uh, right now. I guess Jarosław Kaczyński uh, will be willing to uh, use this time. Uh, he has three years without any uh, domestic campaign uh, to change the state, the institutions of the state, so that uh, to build uh, an institutional advantage over uh, the opposition so that he could win another election in three years' time. Uh, so uh, Jarosław Kaczyński uh, will have to first uh, do some cleaning uh, inside his uh, camp. Uh, there will be uh, a reshuffle of the government. Uh, I guess it's a matter of weeks, perhaps two months. Uh, before the to, 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 to the reshuffle of the government, and uh, then we will have um, internal elections within uh, the ruling party. Uh, the um it, it look, Wojtek, it looks as if you muted yourself. I don't know. No, this just happened. Well, I can tell you, listeners, what Wojtek was about to say. I think he was about to say that Jarosław Kaczyński is going to win these internal elections and that for the moment doesn't seem as if there's going to be a big change in law and justice in the coming weeks or months. So I think for the moment we're going to move on, Wojtek. Thank you for that. Sorry that you muted yourself or that you were muted by your computer. And uh, that was Wojtek Kaczynski, the head of our political desk. Now moving on to our European desk, Agnieszka Smoleńska, if you could answer a question, what 
the result of this election and the fact that peace is going to be in power means for European politics and for uh, Polish politics looking at the upcoming um, summits, the uh, budgetary summit and uh, the climate summit. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be part of this discussion. Um, now, the remarks that I will have are uh, taken looking at, let's say, the way that this uh, election has been portrayed in the media and also the internal discussion uh, of European issues in the context of the election, which um, there has not been a lot of. So first of all, this is, and this is important to point out, European Union as such folk, uh, featured very marginally in these elections. It was a non-topic, despite the fact that both candidates were former MEPs, both had some experience in European issues. Europe as such did not feature prominently in these discussions, not least because the president's role in European policy is somewhat limited. Uh, for the past five years, it has sat firmly with the Chancellery, with the Prime Minister, and now this effect has been further reinforced uh, with a certain reorganization of the ministry um, in, uh, in Poland. Um, so any effects on European policy are collateral rather than deliberate. So these are um, consequences rather than the results of uh, the elections. And I would uh, point to three specific dimensions in this regard. So first you have the bilateral uh, aspect, so president's cooperation with his partners across Europe. Secondly, you have the impact on the government policy and the government's relationship with, uh, with Brussels. And thirdly, you have the wider aspect, and this is something that Michał actually touched upon in the um, discussion that you had last week before the elections. So this broader global context um, in which uh, this election took place, and in particular the discussion between uh, liberalism and uh, illiberalism, authoritarianism and democracy, a uh, discussion that is taking place in a number of countries. So uh, starting with the bilateral aspect, this um, Duda won in competitive elections, and there is an absolutely no doubt about this. Of course, there are certain reservations with regard to the media, but OSCE and uh, international observers confirmed that this was a fair and competitive uh, election. Therefore, on a diplomatic level, you uh, are unlikely to see any mm, deep consequences in terms of recognition of this president. Where you might have um, consequences is the, um, let's say, the perception of this president because the rhetoric he has used has absolutely not gone unnoticed. So the signals that will be sent from other capitals will not be direct, they will rather be informal and indirect because I don't think also there is full re uh, realization here uh, how uh, disturbing have been some of the statements which have been made by the Prime Minister with regard to the minorities. And this includes LGBT minorities, but also um, the Jewish minority. So you might certainly have a certain distancing from the president, maybe some uh, multi, some formats, diplomatic exchange which, exchanges which have been planned, such as the Weimar Triangle Summit. Uh, maybe they will take place in another form. Uh, maybe we'll have an input uh, on this from the Paris side. Now, when it comes to the EU government and uh, to the EU government relationship, uh, this will of course depend on what course the government will take, especially on policies such as the media, uh, further reform of the judiciary, and uh, any limitations of freedom of speech. Uh, there has been a lot of sophisticated uh, analysis already on how EU could respond, and in particular how um, the EU will solve a trilemma between, uh, on the one hand, um, well, on the, then there's a trilemma, three hands, but in the one corner, uh, respecting rule of law, in the second, uh, keeping engagement with the Polish society and not risking alienating Polish society, which even though is very Europhile, uh, you have some, um, let's say, foreboding of possible uh, dis distancing from European issues. And thirdly, not wasting political capital um, uh, on uh, uh, pursuing this debate when it's not, uh, 
the debate concerning rule of law, which is not bringing uh, concrete uh, results. So there has been a lot of sophisticated analysis trying to predict how capitals will react and also what the Polish government will do. But I think it's, all, it's important to remember that we are still in the economic crisis. This will be the worst economic crisis that the EU will face. And just the priorities are different. So a number of commentators have pointed to, and I think rightly, that we might see from Brussels more of a policy of appeasement and managing Poland as a partner in European relations rather than engaging with it constructively. Now, when it comes to the budgetary negotiations, uh, where you might have, um, this is clearly visible because the main topic continue to be uh, rule of law and uh, climate neutrality, whereas the positive agenda that the Warsaw is trying to bring, in particular on very important issue of taxation, which as we have seen today, uh, continues to uh, grapple a number of European citizens. Uh, here, the Polish government's voice is not so much heard, partly because of the loss of uh, trust and uh, this perception of this government as not being um, let's say, fully um, participating, let's say, in the European discussion. And this is not, uh, this is also taking into account the demand for uh, active Polish involvement in European politics. What you might have, therefore, just to sum it, summing up this part, is management of the relations rather than uh, engagement and a policy, let's say, of appeasement trying to manage. This is not, uh, however, without certain instrumentalization of certain policies of Polish government, in particular concerning economic nationalism, where the, um, which, where the Polish policy of stronger role of the state is in economic policy is something that resonates in a number of the bigger capitals, in particular France and Germany. So in particular with regard to competition policy, industrial policy, you might still ha see a lot of engagement with Warsaw on this issue. And just to uh, finalize on the third point, so this broader discussion on um, the authoritarianism, illiberalism, because you can see a lot of um, commentators trying to draw lessons from what has happened in Poland for the uh, for the conflict between the liberals and the liberals across the globe. And there I would caution, because even though you could, um, you can see in Trzaskowski's campaign a very successful attempt to engage with a number of populist issues, in particular with regards to um, uh, responding to the social and economic concerns rather than the big debate between openness and closeness, which the liberal side often favors, um, there we might we have to keep certain proportions. So I would also caution in this approach of seeing the selection as a fork in the road or uh, some kind, kind of definitive resolution to the question of how do we uh, revert um, let's say, the populist forces across Europe. So these would be my introductory points. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Agnieszka. That was perfect. Back to Wojtek for a moment. Wojtek Szatski, are you with us and are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. Okay, Wojtek, quick question from Phyllis Berry. The question is, and this concerns and touches upon something that Agnieszka mentioned, do you think that there was an even playing field in the selection? Do you feel that um, the public media and the state, um, the state owned, uh, the state intervened in these elections? So basically, was there an even playing field? I have no doubt that uh, I have no doubt that uh, the state institutions helped Andrzej Duda a lot. I mean, it was not only the Prime Minister who traveled all over Poland promising money for the local governments uh, and praising Andrzej Duda. Uh, I guess it, all, it helped um, increase the turnout in the rural areas. Uh, also, uh, the Minister of Internal Affairs promised 49 uh, fire trucks uh, to increase uh, the turnout because uh, the local communities with the highest turnout uh, were promised to uh, get a fire truck. And it was a clear message uh, for all the voters 
in those areas, then if they go to the election, uh, their community will get a fire truck uh, from the government. Uh, and it was only for the rural communities, uh, this whole program. Uh, and also the uh, state TV uh, was uh, clearly uh, on the side of uh, Andrzej Duda and uh, all the uh, information broadcast by uh, public television uh, was supposed to destroy uh, Rafał Kaczyński's, uh, uh, to destroy uh, Rafał Trzaskowski's chances of winning uh, the election. Uh, and there, it wasn't only that, that was uh, favorable for um, Andrzej Duda, but uh, they said a lot about, for example, uh, how Trzaskowski would uh, take away um, money from the social programs uh, carried out by the government and uh, give it away to Jews. Uh, so it, uh, it's definitely played a part uh, in Duda's victory. Uh, what uh, the state-owned uh, TV did uh, throughout the campaign. And I wouldn't call it a, an even field. Yeah, I think, I think what we can fairly safely say is that this was a free and unfair election. And I don't know what the OEC would say to this, but I think that basically this is what it boils down to. Over to you, Michal. Thank you very much. Um, so we had a view from Poland looking out, and now we want to have a view from the outside world looking toward uh, Poland. Uh, just one little note on housekeeping, just for everyone who joined us a little bit later. This is on the record, it's being recorded, so if you want to, you can watch it later or share it with your friends. Um, you have ability to ask questions either through the chat function or through Q&A function. We'll wait with most of the questions until uh, later on. I actually just have a question also from uh, Ambassador Nikol, uh, former ambassador of Germany to Poland, with a very good question. But let me first go to our colleagues in Washington, Paris and, uh, and, and, and Berlin. Um, so let me actually start with uh, Susan. Uh, Susan Cork, senior fellow at GMF, and the, the director of Transatlantic Demo Democracy Working Group. Um, Susan, tell us how the election is being viewed from Washington, D.C. Uh, Marek, in his introduction, also mentioned uh, uh, that um, your election uh, and the outcome of the November uh, presidential election, whether this is going to be uh, second term of President Trump or President, new President, President Biden will play a role also very much on the domestic scene. So if you could also at some point put on a little bit of a view with those two scenarios um, playing out. Susan, over to you. Okay, thank you, Michal. Is my audio coming out okay? Okay. Um, hello to everyone. Um, there has been, as Michal mentioned, considerable interest in the Polish election in D.C. Um, because this election was, of course, occur occurring against the backdrop of the pandemic. Um, in the lead up to the first scheduled date in May, um, in the U.S. it was really viewed as a test case for balancing democracy against a health emergency. Um, and American policymakers over here um, you may have seen that in the United States, voting by mail has become a very politicized issue. Um, so uh, there was close attention paid um, to Poland watching as they navigated the dangers of politicizing the measures needed to ensure a safe, free, and fair vote. Um, and it was, you know, fair, fair to say, I think it was a roller coaster in Poland, and it may be in the United States. Um, and in the U.S., it was also viewed as a real test for um, populism, uh, whether it had enduring support in Poland. Um, many of the themes that were conjured in the campaign period in Poland feel very similar to what we're going through right now in America. It was a pretty ugly campaign, at least as viewed um, through what we were reading in the media. Um, it was, the election was framed in very stark terms as a divided electorate and a referendum on Polish identity, that this was a choice between a traditional Poland or a rainbow Poland with liberal values. 
a choice between the real Poland and an urban elite, um, a lot of fear mongering against the other, inflammatory language. Um, and as you, you know, if you've been watching the US election, our incumbent in the US is also using these weapons to divide the country. Um, and he's even turned masks into a divisive issue of identity in the US. Um, you know, it was, I think it was really telling that President Duda faced with um, uncertainty late in the campaign and the late breaking popularity of uh, Trotskowski, um, that he gambled that the voter support that he needed was from President Trump and made the last ditch visit to Washington just days before the election. Um, that visit was widely criticized on both sides of the aisle in DC. It was seen as improper. It was seen as personalizing the bilateral relationship to one unpopular president who may not win in a second term, um, I think. So President Duda moving forward um, is going to need to think about that. Of course, Trump too has been happy to play into that dynamic and personalize the relationship. You know, in his response to Duda, President Duda winning the second term said, congratulations to my friend. President Andre Duda. Um, he's looking forward to continuing our important work. Um, so, you know, the, the stakes were certainly high for Poland's future as a democracy, and people are very worried here in the United States, or particularly I represent the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, which is a bilateral group of transatlanticists, both in the security and the democracy realm. Um, and there's a lot of worry that President Duda will be a rubber stamping president and give uh, the Law and Justice Party a clear path to consolidate the liberal rule. Um, I've said and written that the important thing for the United States is also that it was a free and fair election that produced a le legitimate outcome. Um, and I will say that it was a competitive election, high turnout, um, it was a democratic outcome. Um, but it was a tilt, we were just talking about that it you know, it was a tilted field that favored the incumbent and the OSC monitoring team um, said that, you know, the election was well managed, but there are a lot of um, gaps and hostility threats against the media, um, misuse of state resources. So, um, you know, the, there were definitely deficiencies in the election, but the outcome was democratic. The, you, with the US election underway, it's hard to predict some things. Um, no matter what, Poland is going to be a continued, continue to be a valued bilateral and NATO ally, um, whether it's Trump or Biden. We know Russia will continue to be a threat. Um, I think we have a sense of the path that Trump will continue. Um, under democratic in administration, I believe there will be less bilateral favoritism and a greater emphasis on strengthening, multi strengthening multilateral institutions. Um, I think that there will uh, be more support from the United States in supporting the EU's efforts to hold members accountable to EU commitments. Um, I think that uh, as far as, you know, troops in Poland, I think that, you know, issues like that will continue to move forward, but I think that there will be a greater emphasis on handling those issues within um, NATO, not just in the bilateral realm. Um, there's been some speculation about what Biden's priorities will be. He has a long history of prioritizing the transatlantic alliance. Um, there is some concern that he'll be overly concerned with getting back to normal. Um, and there will be some kind of going back to how things were and not understanding that this is really a system altering moment and that there should also be a focus on looking to new solutions so that the transatlantic can really the transatlantic alliance can better meet new challenges. Um, I think uh, it's safe to say that the expectations here are that peace will continue its liberal path, um, starting with picking up its fight with the independent media. Um, and I think it's safe to say that under Biden that America would again stand up for human rights and democracy. So that would be an area of potential friction. Um, between the U.S. and Poland, um, and and I should say that you know on the independent media issue, that is one issue even under the Trump administration um, where there is bilateral concern. 
Um, so even in a Trump administration, if Poland continues to crack down on independent media, um, that will be something uh, that will be a real issue in the bilateral relationship. The Congress has been very strong on that, and there's some bills underway in Congress um, looking to increase support for independent media. Um, but in short, I think that uh, Biden will have a more pro-Western foreign, foreign policy, um, and he should also, and this is my hope, that he would encourage bridge building um, both in our own country and encourage that with President Duda as a partner. Um, and then I'll just uh, end by saying that, um, you know, I think Biden too, there's, you know, not to be overly optimistic, but I think the focus would be on repairing a lot of the damage and really reprioritizing Europe um, as a whole and individual relationships and rejoining Paris Climate Agreement, pursuing new trade deals, uh, cooperative efforts for technology innovation, um, and really looking to uh, revive trust in America's commitment to values in the world. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you very much for bringing the perspective from Washington and playing with those two scenarios of Trump 2.0 and Biden, Biden's uh, administration. Uh, let me now jump on our side of the Atlantic and go first to our colleague in Paris and then uh, switch to voices from Berlin. Um, Martin Kens, he's a, uh, Martin, fantastic to have you with us. Martin is the deputy director of our Paris office. Tell us how the election is being seen uh, in, in Paris. What's important? Well, thank you, Michel, and uh, hello, everyone. Very happy to, to share with you some, some views from Paris. Um, maybe two main points. One is how the, the results uh, were, were covered by the French media and, and analysts. And, uh, and I think it gives you a sense of, um, in a way, how, how France, the population and the policymakers, um, what, what kind of lessons learned uh, we, we will draw from, uh, from this uh, election. And the second point uh, on, on what sh we should expect for the future of the French-Polish bilateral uh, relationship. So um, in, in the press, uh, the, the, the media coverage was, was kind of uh, uh, unanimous in having three main takeaways. Uh, one is that the, the, the election, um, well, the, the victory went to uh, the favorite candidate, but it was kind of close. And, and this is in a way a surprise as far as the French press covered the, the result. This was this um, very contested uh, result. And, and the question now is whether for peace, the lessons learned is that uh, it validates the, 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 their campaign uh, or it actually should be seen as a warning that, uh, uh, well, they got quite close to uh, a surprise and therefore should change their, 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 their uh, position especially on values and uh, on the EU. Now, of course, there's a lot of uh, wishful thinking, but here in Paris, there is hope that uh, the results will, will give uh, President Duda and peace um, a sense of a warning that uh, going too much uh, to, uh, to the right and, and to a conservative uh, uh, agenda is not uh, perhaps the, the most uh, successful strategy and that uh, there, there will be a need to reconcile uh, Poland and the two Polands that have uh, emerged out of this election. And therefore there's hope uh, in France that this will be the, the main lesson learned for, um, for the peace. Um, the second takeaway is that it's a kind of a validation of this divide between cities and, and countryside, cities and small towns that we see in France, that we see in so many uh, European countries and in, in, in North America. I think this is something that for the French media is remarkable because this is something obviously that we experience uh, directly here um, and, and, and it, it shows in a way for Macron uh, that this is likely to be the geographical divide as well for his re-election in 2022. 
Um, and the third takeaway is, uh, well, the, the, the very high turnout. And, and this is quite different from what we've experienced here in France with uh, especially local elections with only 45% turnout. Um, this is something that is remarkable as far as the French media is concerned and, and, and uh, shows in a way some kind of a democratic health uh, going on in Poland, something that uh, is troubling for Macron when we, when we look what's happening in, in France. So based on, on, on these few, uh, few analysis, it informs in a way uh, the, the way the French government will, will interact with the Polish government in the years to come. Um, I think we should, uh, we should expect a lot of continuation. It's no secret that the, the relationship has been kind of rocky over the couple of last few years and, um, and that there was a hope that uh, uh, there could be a new chapter after this election. Uh, in fact, there will be probably a continuation of an attempt to um, rebuild a, a more positive uh, bilateral relationship with Warsaw, something that we've seen with uh, the Macron's visit to, to Poland earlier this year. Um, but uh, very little, in a way, in more, more concrete policies that could uh, bridge the gap between, between the two countries in terms of values, in terms of our position in the European Union, in terms of our position on, on some um, uh, kind of key priorities for Macron such as climate change, um, there is very little that can be uh, seen as, as, a, as, a, as a sign of optimism uh, coming out of this election. Um, I would say also that uh, there is this sense in France that uh, whatever the election, uh, whatever the result, you cannot do without Poland. So, um, and, I, and I agree with, uh, with what was said before, it was not uh, for Paris a turning point in, in the, in the Franco-Polish relationship. Uh, uh, whether uh, Macron feels uh, more comfortable with, uh, with President Duda or with uh, his opponent, uh, matters very little in the end. Uh, what we've seen over the last three years is that uh, Macron's uh, great European ambition cannot be implemented if he doesn't reach out to uh, Central and, and Eastern European countries and in particular to Poland. This is clearly one of the lessons learned of the last three years for, for Paris. Uh, this will continue and, and this is something that we should expect uh, will guide uh, France's policy towards Warsaw uh, uh, until 2022. And finally, uh, the main contentious issues will not change either. So we know uh, Russia, we know uh, defense industrial projects will remain kind of the, 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 the point of tensions between Warsaw and Paris. Uh, there is very little uh, hope that uh, th th there will be an agreement or even some kind of a rapprochement between the two countries on, on these issues. And, and I think uh, uh, we should not, uh, we should not uh, imagine that there could be uh, kind of a breakthrough in the years to come. Uh, and I'll just finish with, uh, with uh, one, one kind of thought that, that is uh, very much uh, um, also in line with what was said before, um, the, the defining points will, will come from external factors. So the US elections will truly uh, uh, be seen for France as, as the turning point for the European project and, and potentially put Poland and France into opposite uh, camps. So if you have a Trump election in, in November, there you can imagine a, a quick uh, a deterioration of the bilateral relationship. I'll, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you very much, Martin. Very interesting. Uh, it's almost, it's a joke, but it almost seems like we are having a bit of a third round of election here um, on November uh, happening in Washington, D.C. Let me now come even closer um, to, to Poland and turn to uh, Christoph von Marshall uh, from Berlin, uh, uh, editor and foreign uh, diplomatic correspondent in the Tagesspiegel, but also a former fellow at DMF. Uh, Christoph could even switch to Polish, but because we uh, are speaking in English, we'll keep it to, uh, to English. Um, Christoph, uh, relations with Germany uh, have not only been um, an issue, a foreign policy issue, but really a, almost an identity issue brought forward in this, in this election. Um, uh, to what extent, what, you know, what is the reaction that you are seeing right now in Berlin? Um, and uh, how do you see uh, the, the election of President Duda can impact both bilateral uh, relationship, but also uh, Berlin's perception of Poland within the within EU? Christoph, over to you. Thank you, Michal. 
It's great to be back with the GMF family uh, to see people in Washington DC where I spent 10 months in 2017, 18 for my uh, book as the first Helmut Schmidt fellow, but also to see Martin in Paris, who also helped me with the, uh, with the French angle uh, for my book and of course uh, people in, in, in Warsaw. Well, um, the reaction in Germany, it's, it's a mixture of, I, I would say, four main feelings. There's this disappointment, hope, fear, and warnings. So uh, clearly the majority in Germany would have hoped for a different outcome, probably also in the government. But as you know, um, we, we practice diplomatic politeness. So near from our Bundespräsident Steinmeier, nor from the government, you could see any open expression of this disappointment. Uh, the federal president congratulated uh, Duda to the victory. Of course, if you want to read something into that uh, note, uh, you would also notice uh, that uh, he wished uh, Duda a good hand to keep the Polish nation united. And he hoped also that they can both together do more for a good neighborly relationship. So you can interpret that positively or as a sort of polite uh, criticism. It was much more open when you look at the foreign policy experts in the different political parties, let's say Mr. Wadepool in the uh, CDU or um, Mr. Sarrazin with the Green Party, and the same would be true for the Social Democrats and others. They rather said that they hope on one hand uh, that President Duda interprets the outcome, the narrow outcome of the election as a warning sign, and but also as a mandate to unite now the nation, not to continue uh, this um, policy, which is rather dividing this society. Uh, but um, the hope rather turns then into the fear that it will not happen, that it's rather the opposite, that PIS uh, understands the outcome of the election as a mandate uh, to continue with reforms. And then they would go to voices like Justice Minister Jobro, who want to continue justice reform and the reform uh, of the courts. Uh, or they would turn to people who said uh, that they want to continue with the repolonization of the media, which is clearly directed to German companies like Springer or the Passauer Verlagsgruppe, who hold a lot of uh, control over Polish media didn't try to interfere as far as I see it, or most people in Germany see it, but they were attacked also during the campaign. So we had a clear anti-German note, uh, at least from the side of President Duda, who also uh, expressed his anger over a column of a German correspondent, uh, and he named him by name, uh, Mr. Fritz. Uh, of course, I think he just used it because Fritz is a synonym for all Germans, and not just because this special person is Mr. Fritz, but all this was noticed over here. It was understood that this is uh, an election where anti-German feelings might be tested, whether you can take advantage of that uh, or not. It is also noticed the geographical divide that all the uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the regions in the West and the Southwest and the North voted uh, pro Chaskowski the East and the South voted uh, pro-Duda. So all what is close to the German-Polish border um, is not Chaskowski or PO land, it's not uh, Duda uh, land, uh, at least in the majority. So there are a lot of angles. So disappointment over the outcome, one would have hoped uh, that it's rather Chaskowski victory, which would give more control and uh, more um, divided power to both camps. Uh, there was the hope that uh, Duda and the peace will understand uh, this as a warning sign and also that an encouragement to really use now the possibility to unite the country, but mixed with the fear uh, that it will not um, happen, that it is rather uh, will turn out uh, differently. So uh, rather here's the interpretation that for the next three years at least, a little bit more than three years, we will have do, to do with another attempt of peace um, to, um, to gain more power and to get a structural grip on power positions in the media, uh, in the uh, government and um, the administration. And um, that this is not the best uh, for German-Polish uh, relations 
for cooperation, whether it is at the border or whether it is in the European Union. And uh, Poland will rather become uh, or continue to be a rather difficult partner in the European Union on one hand, on the other hand, a country which uh, you can't uh, overlook and uh, where we need to do business with also when it now comes to the budget um, discussions at the summit uh, at the end of this week. Um, I would think that according to the government, we have a little bit a different um, look on it than in the society. In the German society, in the German media, the budget uh, conflict is mainly presented as a conflict between southern countries like Italy and Spain and northern frugal countries like the Netherlands and Austria. But the central eastern European angle is uh, very often overlooked and it's not seen uh, by the public and by the media. I think the government sees it clearly that the central eastern European states are more than 10 out of the 27 member states. So they have a certain weight and they have a certain say. And there might be rather the fear uh, that the south and the central east of the EU could unite against the richer countries um, in the uh, north. So that is the European angle that business in the EUP in the EU under German presidency will not become easier through the election results um, uh, in Poland. And the last angle, I just pointed out uh, to make a little bit this difference to what uh, Susan Kor gave us or Martin uh, from Paris. There's certainly not a feeling that the Polish outcome or the outcome in November in the United States could be a template what is happening in, in Germany. And here is rather the feeling that we are, that the society here, that the elections here are totally different. Of course, we have also this division between the bigger cities and the countryside when you look at election results, but it is not that feeling that this is mainly um, what drives um, German politics or that we could, could end up there where we see the steep division of the political camps in the United States and in Poland. Germany is rather or feels itself a little bit more consensus driven and if at all um, I would say that many Germans still have difficulties to understand what is happening in Poland, but also difficulties to respect what is happening outside of their borders, because there is always a sort of feeling of a moral superiority that we have more understanding for minorities and we have the better energy policy or whatever. So that is dividing us. Thank you, Michal. I was just uh, at the end of my remarks. Thank you very much, Christo. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll have a lot of follow-up uh, questions also for the perspective from, uh, from Berlin. Um, uh, questions are coming through chat, from Q&A, through other channels. So Andre and I will try to uh, organize them a little bit. But maybe, maybe I can actually, we can, we can continue um, uh, to, with, with another voice uh, from, uh, from Berlin, but also, also uh, Polish speaking. Uh, the voice. Uh, Rolf Nickel, former ambassador to Poland, currently vice president at DGAP, a, a good friend. Um, Rolf, we'll be able to unmute you um, so you can uh, weigh in both with your comments and your question and I see that you unmuted, so over to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here uh, and for giving me the opportunity to say just a few words. Actually, I was just as wanted to. I just wanted to ask uh, one one question, which is, uh, we have seen uh, during the campaign uh, a sort of an instrumentalization of Germany. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the attack on on uh, Mr. Fritz, as uh, Christopher von Marshall already pointed out. We've also seen that um, the new German ambassador, this is my successor, is waiting for a very long time for his agreement. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's come as a, as a little bit as a surprise since uh, uh, Andrzej Duda formerly on a number of occasions had said that he would, be, would like to be considered as an attorney for good Polish-German relations. 
so in so that was a that was a little bit of a surprise. And my question here really is: uh, is is there any evidence that this instrumentalization worked one way or the other? Uh, and secondly, is there any concern amongst uh, amongst anybody uh, uh, on the panel that there may be some retaliation from from the side of Germany? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolf. Um, great to have you with us. We, we very care comparing notes with Andre, and we thought we'll pass this question to Wojtek Szatski uh, to, to take on first. Wojtek. Um, can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you for this question. I guess uh, there is no evidence that it helped, but it, there is also no evidence that it didn't help. Uh, and uh, my take is that uh, my take is that uh, it is traditional for uh, the right wing parties to seek an enemy, uh, especially a foreign enemy. And Germans are uh, a very good target, along with Jews and sometimes uh, refugees from uh, Islamic countries. Uh, and the ruling uh, right-wing parties often use this as a weapon, as a tool to mobilize its voters, its base, especially in the rural areas. Uh, and it comes together with an attack on uh, German uh, media or so-called German media in Poland. Uh, the ruling camp says that uh, they were attacked first by uh, tabloid uh, fact, uh, which suggested that Andrzej Duda uh, gave a pardon to a pedophile uh, together with uh, the photos of Andrzej Duda uh, and the description of this uh, crimes committed by this pedophile. Uh, so they felt they were under attack and they uh, uh, strike, they stroke back. Uh, and I, I guess it could give that, them, uh, unfortunately, some, uh, some votes. I think the, the second question that Ambassador Nickel asked was, uh, is anybody w worried about the state of Polish-German uh, relations? Um, I don't know, Agnieszka Marek, would you, would you venture an opinion? Are people worried? If I could start and then I, I pass on the word. Um, I would say that there are two things to look out at. One is the politicization of diplomacy in Poland. So if you, you see an active engagement of, uh, of a number of people from the foreign ministry uh, who are very active also in the, in the party. And this is therefore this uh, uh, subjugation of uh, diplomatic interests to the party interest is something that is quite visible. On the other hand, you of course have the economic aspect where absolutely there is worry, I would say, because it's, uh, it was very strong language, it was quite aggressive, so the worry that this could have repercussions is uh, uh, absolutely there. So I'm sure there is there is also thinking of how and uh, how damage control in this situation should be pursued. Um, at the same time, I think I would say that the um, context of the German presidency is also quite important in terms of expectation of certain retaliation because obviously for the next six months at least, um, Germany has to be the honest broker across the EU. So its capacity to um, retaliate in any form would not be very well seen in other European member states as well. So, uh, this is, let's say, the analytical answer to the question. And if I may just add, you know, the dimension that I'm working on uh, on a daily basis. Uh, just as we speak uh, here, there is another discussion taking place in Warsaw, namely between AKK, the German defense uh, minister, and um, Polish defense minister Mariusz Błaszczak. AKK, of course, is, is, is coming to Warsaw, um, I would say, by a EU and NATO rulebook. Uh, 
maybe that you know Poland is a is a is a, is a major contributor to uh, defense in the NATO eastern flank, and the and Germany is taking over EU presidency, and Germany is in discussion with the United States about the uh, basing of U.S. troops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and it is. Uh, advisable at least to uh, come and visit uh, Poland. But if there is some kind of uh, damage control taking place by the Polish government, I don't know if, but if there is one, I would imagine that Mr. Błaszczak is the first one to um, sort of um, communicate the the real non-campaign uh, position of, Pol of, of the Polish government, which, as I said in my introductory remarks, is is, you know, one of at least not being reluctant to cooperate and at least not being against any EU and, uh, you know, especially NATO uh, cooperation. To the contrary, Poland should be and at least officially is uh, uh, f fully agreeable to, to uh, deepening uh, defense and security uh, cooperation in Europe. But uh, to Ambassador Nichols' question, I was actually surprised that you, Ambassador, were surprised to see those anti-German um, uh, sentiments uh, re-emerging in the Polish campaign, because it seems as though it is a, uh, you know, a, an, an ABC of the right-wing political uh, camp that, as, as Wojtek Szatsky uh, mentioned, uh, they were always uh, raising the Polish-German issues in political campaigns, they were always looking for some external enemies. Uh, and of course, since the general climate of Polish-German relations is perhaps not uh, in, in its heights, it was no surprise, at least to me, that, that the Polish-German issue was again, was again used as a, as a tool or, 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 or as a as a um, as a weapon in this political campaign. Thank you very much, Agnieszka and, and Marek. We'll now switch to a lot of the questions that are that came through chat and and Q and A. There were a number of them about media and uh, freedom into the media, and also and, and also reactions in both uh, Washington and, and Berlin. So, paraphrasing a little bit, uh, a question from. Uh, ambassador of Canada, uh, well, of Canada in Poland, Leslie Scanlon. She she was asking basically whether whether there is an expectation that U.S. So that's a question to Susan. Whether the, there is expectations that U.S. might play the role, the card of security and defense cooperation with Poland in defense of uh, media, if the media came under. Uh, a pressure, and maybe if if then uh, I could ask someone from from the uh, Polish Insight team whether there is a worry about this. But Susan, just briefly on on uh, on whether the U.S. you think could would should uh, play this card. Thanks. Sure. Um, interesting question. Uh, so again, the answer would be somewhat different in a Trump or Biden administration. Um, you know, and in the Trump administration, this for us was one of the few areas where we were able to find some bipartisan consensus and concern. And, you know, the U.S. ambassador in Poland um, as a businesswoman, you know, was receptive to the arguments that, you know, uh, you know foreign media in Poland, the pressure, the, it's important for the business climate. Um, so I don't think under a Trump administration you would see the willingness to play a central role. Um, you know, this is also happening at the same time that there's been a lot of um, uproar in DC about the new head of US Agency for Global Media, Michael Pack, um, firing the heads of Radio for Europe and the other networks and um, potentially, you know, politicizing and turning that into a, a propaganda type outlet. So. Broadly speaking, the Trump administration has not been critical of such moves and has been replicating some of them, but there has been, you know, we've been kind of helping to piece together those on both sides of the aisle um, in and out of government who care about that. And Congress has been very strong and their approach right now on encouraging me media freedom is to do it from a regional perspective and 
that it's important for the resiliency of democracy and encouraging the National Endowment for Democracy to fund more there. And there's $20 million um, being considered in the current uh, foreign operations bill. So in the US, it's kind of this piecemeal approach, but all together it adds up to, you know, that that's one of the few priority bipartisan issues. Um, under a Biden administration, I think that there will be more willingness to um, be unified in public about those concerns and be something that um, we would be expecting out of the relationship. And, you know, that there might be, uh, but I, I don't know that there would be a willingness to kind of consolidate an approach, um, again, because that has been a sensitive issue with Poland and it probably will continue to be with President Duda, but I do think you would see more pressure um, from the United States on that issue and that the there would be more funding um, from you know, the State Department, USAID, and to the National Endowment for Democracy towards um, uh, supporting uh, independent media in Poland. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, Marek, we'll turn to you, but there are a number of other questions that you might want to address at the same time. So we'll pile them up on, uh, at you a little bit. Uh, uh, Johannes is also asking about Poland's uh, relations with uh, China and the future of 5G. And also there was a question about future of Poland's relations with uh, Ukraine, I believe, also from uh, from Johannes. So maybe we could take the U.S. pressure or not, uh, and then China and Ukraine for you know uh, so, uh, uh, one uh, minute. I think. Yeah, very <laughs> briefly uh, on media. I would very much echo Susan's uh, opinion that it were it it will depend largely on on the outcome of the U.S. elections because I wouldn't expect any major action being taken under Trump's presidency uh, if it will continue, certainly because you can see striking similarities in the language uh, between what Mr. Trump says about media and what the Polish government and the Polish president uh, says about media. Regardless of the positions taken by the US ambassador here, Mrs. Georgia Mosbacher, who is acting, I would say, in an in, in an unorthodox way, to say the least, and I'm not quite sure whether her actions uh, and her statements are really hel helping the, uh, uh, to promote the cause. Uh, yes, she's been very vocal in defense of um, one specific media company owned by the, uh, uh, by the US uh, business, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that, sh that her influence on the Polish government is, uh, is that strong that, that it may change uh, their actions. Uh, on, on China and, and 5G, we're still in, in the process of, of formulating our, our policies. Um, and I would just think that the recent UK decision and, and the, uh, the comment made by uh, uh, Donald Trump on that, that he actually own, owned that decision uh, and, and claimed he was, he was the, um, uh, the real the decisive power behind that decision. It may also influence the Polish um, uh, decision makers. Um, in, the, in the broader China context, we have a problem uh, in, in Poland because on the one hand, we've been very keen on um, attracting uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese investments in many fields before this current wave of anti-Chinese policies uh, uh, from the US. And actually some of these investments uh, proved quite uh, 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 beneficiary for the Polish uh, economy in, in, in larger terms. And there is a big debate what to do about this problem. And I don't see any clear policies yet formulated uh, by the government, um, maybe also because of the you know, continuous election campaign campaigns in Poland. But certainly, as I said in my introductory remarks, this is one of the key issues uh, on the agenda. On Ukraine, um, uh, we we, do, we didn't see any real um, any real 
you know, positive outcomes of the uh, Zelensky presidency towards, uh, you know, Polish-Ukraine relations. We don't see any uh, reapproachment on the, the difficult historical issues that we have with uh, Ukraine. We're fine on the sort of the general threat assessment and uh, security and defense policies, but this is driven mainly by the US and by uh, NATO. Um, and, and, and yes, we will probably uh, look into some kind of reformulating of that uh, policy. But again, um, this is probably not the key issue for, for peace uh, government and, and also for Duda personally. And I guess we will need to wait another few months until the government, the peace government, the cabinet reforms itself after the success of the two elections and, and, and until the president formulates his uh, goals for the new term. Okay, Agnieszka, I have two questions for you from the panel. Um, one is about an active engagement by Poland in shaping future EU policies in Andrzej Duda's second term. I think you basically you sort of answered that in your introduction, but if you could sort of build on that. And a second question, which I think is uh, very well suited to your interests. Uh, what was the reaction in Poland to the fact that Mr. Donoghue of Ireland became the chair of the Eurogroup? My guess is that one of the few people who noticed it in Poland was you. So, um, so if you could tell us what you think. Okay, so uh, starting with the active engagement in EU policies, it's uh, I did touch upon it a little bit previously, as you mentioned. Um, so first of all, the president doesn't play that big of a role. However, uh, when it comes to active engagement, this is also preconditioned somewhat by the perception of Poland. So one policy is where you see a lot of active, proactive engagement is um, the area of taxation. Uh, where Poland is coming up with new ideas to solve the budgetary hole, which appeared after Brexit, specifically giving um, concrete proposals on digital tax and uh, other possible new own resources. The problem is whether when um, your position is undermined as a result, for example, of the way that you do bilateral you use or instrumentalize uh, your partners, whether that um, undermines your ability to successfully upload even good ideas. And uh, I think this taxation issue is one of the examples where you can see the consequences of your policies, even in those areas where you are looking for uh, an active uh, engagement. So um, when it comes to Mr. Donahoe and uh, the chairmanship of the Eurogroup, I think it's a fascinating question. Um, most, there were three candidates and out of the three candidates for the Eurogroup position, uh, the Irish uh, Minister of Finance was the only one that referred directly to the inclusive format of the Eurogroup. Uh, that is the format where the uh, 19 ministers of the Eurozone are joined by the other, uh, other ministers of finance across the EU uh, when discussing very important topics such as, uh, relating to the future reform of the EMU. Uh, this openness uh, expressed by the, Mr. Donahoe is in contrast to the approaches that probably would have been taken by uh, Nadia Calvino, who was much more oriented towards consolidating the reform in the Eurozone and also uh, expanding on the role of the budget in, um, in Eurozone economic policies, let's say it that way. So from the perspective of Warsaw, having um, chairman of the Eurogroup who is open is very important, um, even if it is not noticed, because it means that the voice of the Euro outs, uh, which has significantly uh, decreased with Brexit and now with the um, expansion of the Eurozone to Croatia and Bulgaria planned for 2023, um, it's, a, yeah, I mean, it's a very positive development from the perspective of Euro 
out. So regardless of the question, which I think is still uh, can be asked uh, whether it is not high time to have a broader discussion of po in Poland on the consequences of staying out in Europe after Brexit and in Europe with uh, where uh, only six member states uh, remain out of the Eurozone. Okay, thank you Agnieszka. I'm glad you could answer that question. Um, a question to Wojtek Szatsky. The question is about the emancipation of Andrzej Duda from his mentor, uh, Jarosław Kaczyński. Do you believe that it is possible that Andrzej Duda in his second term will take a more centrist and less right-wing approach to politics? I hope you can hear me. Sorry for all those technical problems. Uh, well, in theory, uh, I guess Andrzej Duda has a chance of becoming more independent because uh, he will not be running for his third term. This is his second and last term. So in theory, he doesn't need the support of the party and he might become a little bit more independent uh, and more important player within the uh, ruling camp. But I don't know if he is able to um, do so and to at least uh, try to become more powerful player uh, and more powerful politician. Uh, I guess uh, we will know more once the, um, his uh, office will be uh, created, whether he will be trying to find some experienced politicians and to enhance the uh, presidential chancellery and presidential palace uh, but I don't know if uh, he's psychologically able to do so uh, and also I wouldn't expect a war uh, against uh, peace I think that his the links between uh, Duda and uh, peace are too close and he knows that what the for example the state on TV uh, will do to him if he starts to um, to break the uh, the line and the unity of the ruling camp. So I don't, I wouldn't expect a major conflict between them. I would expect Andrzej Duda to find a way to become a little bit perhaps different from the uh, ruling party. Uh, I would expect one veto per year, for example, uh, not five vetoes uh, per year. Uh, but I guess we will have to give him some time to uh, reconsider and to think uh, over plans uh, of his presidency. Thank you very much, uh, Wojtek. Uh, we now have also with us uh, Lee Feinstein, uh, former ambassador of US to Poland. We'll be able to unmute you in just one second. There is also a, a couple of people raised hands, uh, Klaus Wittmann, for example. If you could just maybe uh, type it in in the chat, your question, because we are trying to group them and it's not so easy to unmute people. So just let us know and we are doing our best. We probably not be able to answer all the questions, but we'll, we are doing our best. Um, Lee, uh, good to see you uh, virtually uh, in Poland. Uh, over to you as, uh, and we'll unmute you right now. You are unmuted. Try one more time. There you go. Thanks everyone for an excellent conversation. It's, uh, it's terrific to be able to uh, hear from all these different transatlantic perspectives. Um, I had a question uh, about, uh, uh, and Susan Cork addressed this as did others, if there were to be a, a, a Biden administration in the United States, uh, whether uh, cooperation between the United States and Europe on uh, rule of law issues uh, could be um, uh, more effective uh, than the uh, approach uh, now where the United States and the European Union were on uh, different sides of this question? Um, or do you think that uh, um, more likely um, a, a Polish government would just uh, seek to wait out any kind of um, diplomatic uh, pressure uh, that it saw? 
Thank you, Lee, very much for this. I, I'm thinking that maybe we'll go to Marek with this question. Um, hopefully we are not surprising you, Marek, too much with this. Okay. No, no, of course I was listening to Ambassador uh, Feinstein. Um, as I said, I, I, I would probably think about the answer in terms of who wins the election in the United States first, uh, and then uh, how will the, the EU new uh, power structure emerge after COVID and after, because COVID has, has made some, some pause in the, in the shaping of, of, of new EU uh, um, uh, directions. If, if those two combine, if Biden comes to power and there will be some more traditional approach to US external policies, combined with some more uh, pro-democracy oriented European approach, including you know, stronger emphasis on, uh, on, on rule of law linked to, for instance, EU funding, then the, the leverage will be really strong on, on Polish authority, uh, authorities. Otherwise, I cannot see you know, real um, pressure tools in hands of those who would like to, uh, uh, to exert that, that pressure. Thank you very much, Marek. Um, we are slowly coming to, work, to, 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 to the end. We have a couple other questions, but for those uh, participants, if you can, this is your last real chance to ask ask a question. Um, I, we have one question that we haven't yet asked that goes to uh, Christoph uh, von Marshall. It, it's also in relation to uh, to the to the media. I think a lot of participants uh, are um, concerned about the the role of the media in uh, in Polish uh, politics. But there are really two. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask both of them. One was about whether you would expect, Christoph, any pushback, more active pushback from Berlin if indeed there was an effort to colonize, deconcentrate ownership of uh, media in Poland, uh, especially that have German ownership. The, the second question actually flipped, uh, so to say. There was one question from uh, Jakub, uh, asking whether, uh, and maybe that's to you, Christoph, maybe it's to others, now whether the, we have in fact seen an undue uh, influence of foreign media, in, uh, foreign media, not public media, in Polish, uh, in Polish politics. Um, I would also ask that you all think about your last, uh, the panelists, uh, last things that you could, uh, that you want to weigh in, and we'll do a lightning closing round after Christoph's uh, answer. Thanks. Well, when it comes to the pushback uh, against the reprogramization of um, so-called German media in Poland or Polish media owned by German uh, companies, I don't think this would mainly go through Berlin. I rather think that the German government would say, this is a question of the internal market, that is a Brussels issue, it is oversight uh, over the general market of businesses, and they would try to avoid to address this as a special German-Polish question. In background talks, um, it might be different, but I think in the public domain, they would rather think that it's a Brussels question and not a German-Polish uh, question. But as already Agnieszka and others pointed out, there is this general feeling that uh, Poland is losing sympathies um, in Germany. And uh, also Johannes Adefeld asked about uh, the general atmosphere. And um, I, I think, with a growing frustration over Polish behavior, whether it's in the European Union, whether it's in the neighborship, there is less, less willingness if Poland comes with a certain agenda, which is important to Poland to say, oh yeah, here we have a partner we should support and to whose wishes we should have open ears. Uh, it is, um, that is human business. If, if people are friendly and forthcoming for you, you try to be more forthcoming uh, to them and uh, vice versa. And that is, I think, <clears throat> the main damage that the goodwill 
uh, of a lot of <clears throat> Germans, whether they have an official post in government or not, is a little bit reduced uh, by the perception how the Germans perceive uh, the uh, actions of peace and also President Duda. Okay, so starting with, with uh, sort of summing up round, I think we, we just talked with Michal about giving each and one of you a chance to, to say, to have some final closing remarks. Um, just to throw these three issues out there, which maybe you'd like to address, and I'm, this is a plural you, uh, depending on anybody who would like to address these issues. Um, one is specifically on Polish human relations in terms not of institutional contacts, but basically of the attitude of Polish society to Germans and Germany. Another question was about Poland's role in democracy promotion, especially in Belarus. And a third question, and this is uh, this I'd address specifically to Wojtek, so that maybe in your closing remarks, Wojtek, you've spoken a lot about peace. Could you say a word about Trzaskowski, what this means for the opposition, what this means for the rising star of the Polish opposition, if Trzaskowski is still that? So I don't know in what uh, order we want to go. Maybe we'd start with Martin, and then just we're going to shout out your names, and you say whatever you want to say. Sure, I can start. Um, just um, one one main thought, in a way, which is which uh, is surprising to me here is that we, we talk a lot about uh, Polish-German relationship, but as Christoph just mentioned, I think a lot of things will happen rather in Brussels, um, and the way um, a lot of the of the of the over the last couple of weeks um, in France, in particular, the big question was whether after um, the economic ref uh, recovery plan is is implemented. The balance of power between Brussels and the member states uh, will change on all kind of issues, not only on, on, on uh, economic issues, but uh, at one point, uh, the one that uh, that has uh, the power of the, over the money has leverage. Um, so it was also part of the French discussion on, on the future of Poland uh, after the, the result of the election is whether after COVID, uh, Brussels will have more of a say and perhaps more leverage on internal uh, affairs, not only in Poland, but on all, in all member states, and, and whether uh, this is something that we should uh, consider more, more, more uh, specifically, rather than thinking that Paris or Berlin will, will really uh, chip in. It, it's more of a balance of power between Brussels and member states that we should, uh, we should discuss. Okay, Susan, could we move over to you? Sure, and I'm glad to see that Asia asked this question. Um, you know, I pragmatically, um, and particularly if it's a Trump administration, I think it's probably, and given President Duda's win, it's probably unlikely that um, we can expect much in terms of Poland's role in democracy promotion, but to paint, you know, probably the most optimistic, rosy scenario that I will be probably proposing, particularly if there is a Biden administration is, um, you know, Poland and the U.S. used to have a very close relationship in terms of supporting democracy together. And, you know, Poland understood that that was important to the U.S. relationship. So in a Biden administration, if uh, President Duda understands that that's really important to the bilateral relationship, I see that there could be some potential there. Um, in terms of Belarus, Poland had been our, one of our strongest partners in terms of um, supporting uh, democracy in Belarus and put in the frame of countering Russian influence. Um, Belarus will continue to be, you know, border state there. Um, you know, one issue that we haven't really talked about is that in countering Russia, um, you know, kind of the disinformation and how it's able to have outside impact on democracies um, with uh, disinformation and propaganda, that would be something that would be good to work on. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that, you know, the, a similar question was asking about, is there a chance for President Duda to be more independent? And, you know, he is overseeing a split country. If he, um, uh, hopefully a Biden presidency would encourage him to try to be more of a uniter and reach out to Trzaskowski supporters who are younger um, and seek 
some new solutions um, and that that could be something that the Biden administration could be encouraging um, ties to you know both sides of, of Poland, not just um, the peace administration as and personalizing the relationship as Trump has done. So in the most optimistic scenario, um, and as I think Marek said, if the EU um, has a, a stronger pro-democracy group, there is a scenario where this is possible, but it's at this point not particularly likely. Christoph? Now I'm unmuted. No, just one uh, last point because we haven't uh, yet talked about that. There is a certain stabilizer in the German-Polish relationship, uh, which is economy and trade. And um, it is not without differences. I mean, there's always this Polish feeling that they don't want to be just uh, the hinterland uh, of the German economy, which uh, delivers parts but has no real own uh, impact. But on the other hand, even during Corona, uh, Poland's um, place moved up uh, in the hierarchy. Uh, Poland is now uh, trade partner number five, if overtook Great Britain and Italy uh, in the last uh, month. Whether that is going to stay is a different question, but even if they fall back to place six or, or seven, it is still an enormous, um, uh, it, it is of enormous importance that we have this stable uh, trade relationship. It's not just trade of goods, it is interconnected. You know, um, Poland's economic uh, success depends on Germany and Germany's economic ex success also depends very much uh, on Poland. And that is, a, that is a good thing. And again, a lot of Germans are not aware of that. I hope in Poland there is a awareness of, of this fact. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph. Marek. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, um, um, I would like to point your attention to one issue which is uh, linked to Poland's European Poland's German positions, Poland's US position that will actually take place in the coming weeks and that we haven't discussed yet in, in detail. That is the how Poland navigates through the issue of relocation of the US troops. Uh, we can expect the Pentagon slash White House report to the congressional committees in the coming weeks, um, especially taking into consideration that there will be a, a, an August break in, in the Congress. And the, the issue is really pressing on both sides, I mean, on, or, or on three, uh, all three sides, or maybe even four sides, because there is a, a, a NATO side as, as an institution towards that. So um, uh, we, we can see a change of Poland's language in the recent months and weeks, actually, or maybe even days, because uh, even if it wasn't Polish intention, uh, the impression was that Poland uh, would be happy to capitalize on a decision which was widely regarded as detrimental to NATO. Now Poland communicates very clearly that it, it is not happy with that. And I would very much like to see what will be the end result of that, whether we will see at all any additional US troops moved from Germany to Poland, or the debate will actually uh, take another direction uh, in the coming uh, months. This is my, my final things that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. Um, so from my side also, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. It's, uh, it, I found it very fruitful also for, from our point of view. Um, what I would like to reiterate specifically is perhaps this point that um, with regard to the future EU-Brussels relations, we are waiting very much to see which course the government will take and there are a number of different options. However, there is also a certain path dependency with regard to how EU is being perceived uh, currently or is being used. And um, I think there, especially the results of the elections, which is very much 50 towards closure Europe of nation states and 50%, almost 50% for uh, people who are very much in favor of, integra well, in favor of integration. There are some uh, polling 
uh, there is some polling which has shown that, in fact, among Trzaskowski voters, around 70% would be in favor of adopting the euro. This is something that should not be lost, especially given this perception of this election as a fork in the road. So there is a clear need, especially on European issues, which Martin has raised, um, especially when we think about the uh, future let's say, of engagement uh, of uh, European partners, not only at the state level, but also at, uh, let's say, societal and uh, local level, because there you might find uh, more support for further integration ideas as well in the future. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Agnieszka and Wojtek. Your last words. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the discussion, all the questions. Uh, when it comes to the opposition and the, the future of the opposition, uh, when you take a look at the outcome of the uh, presidential election, you might say that uh, there are two uh, more or less halves of the society and of the voters, but it's not completely true. Uh, the this opposition's uh, half is much is first of all is smaller, but also it's not uh, as united as uh, the uh, rolling camp, uh, and there will be lots of conflicts uh, between uh, between the PO, uh, the left, uh, the Holovnia's movement, uh, and so on, so on, because all of those parties uh, will be looking for building their own identity, uh, so it will be very hard for Trzaskowski to build a party or to um, take control of the party and uh, beat peace uh, in the foreseeable future. But on the other hand, uh, his defeat doesn't mean an end uh, of his career because uh, we have seen at least two major Polish politicians who lost presidential campaigns and then became a very very powerful uh, politicians, uh, and uh, the, those names include uh, Donald Tusk, uh, who lost in 2005, and Jarosław Kaczyński, who lost in 2010. Uh, so nothing has ended for uh, Trzaskowski, but uh, he will have to fight his uh, way into power. Okay, if I can have one last remark and comment. Um, I think very often we, we are asking ourselves, and you've asked us a number of times, will uh, Andrzej Duda try to regain independence from Jarosław Kaczynski, from his party? I think the, this question is open, but whatever the answer to that question, there's one thing I think needs to be said. At the moment we're looking at a sort of bird war in Poland between hawks and doves. And I'm not certain that if Andrzej Duda were to become independent of Jarosław Kaczyński, he would, he would become a dove and he'd be with the dovish camp. I think that actually Andrzej Duda is something of a hybrid. I think he's either a hove or a dock. And we will find out only once he regains independence who he really is, because it's not certain from my perspective, from my point of view, that he would take Poland to the center and he'd take Poland back to Europe if he were to emancipate himself from Yaroslav Kaczynski. So I wanted to say that, and I wanted to thank Michal Baranowski very much for the invite and for co-hosting this and for this um, initiative. So thank you, Michal, and over to you. Thank you very much, Andrzej. Um, and thank you all for joining us, those on the other side of the screen. Big thank you to our panelists. I hope that coming out from this discussion, you at least have uh, a sense, because there was so much, uh, but I. I I learned a lot about possible scenarios, both for Poland's domestic developments, but also Poland's foreign relations. And we clearly see how much it depends also on the actions of our allies uh, on the other side of the Atlantic and our uh, friends and partners and allies on this side of the, of the Atlantic. So uh, more to come. Uh, I, in this place, wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, Politica Inside and the team. Thanks to Andrzej, uh, but also thanks to uh, Agnieszka, Marek and Wojtek. Um, and I think it was a really very fruitful way of being able to look from the inside out and from the outside in 
on uh, Poland's place in, in Europe and the world. So thank you all, uh, stay safe, uh, have good vacation for those of you that uh, leave a little bit and see you sometime soon. Thanks, ciao.